Math 31, let's make sure we know how to find the equation of the inverse function of f of x. So for a one-to-one -one function, which is very important, these functions have to be one-to-one -one or there is no inverse. Um, for a one-to-one -one function f, defined by an equation y equaling f of x, find the defining equation of the inverse as follows, right? And if necessary, replace f of x with y first, any restrictions on f excuse me, on x and y should be considered. And we'll talk about all of this when we get into the domain aspect of things. But, well, the domain and range aspect of things, excuse me. So here are your three steps. If I give you a function, what I want you to do is interchange x and y. All right, this will be step one. So wherever you see an x, write a y. Wherever you see a y, write an x. So just flip-flop the letters. Or if you have ordered pairs, flip-flop the order. And then I want you to solve for y, okay? And once you solve for y, we're going to replace y with the symbol f inverse of x, okay? So these will be our three steps. We're really going to play that out in part b over here. Um, I'm going to show you how to do it with ordered pairs. It's a little simpler when it's only ordered pairs. It's a little bit trickier when it's a function, but we're going to, or an analytical function, right? So this is going to be numerical. This is just analytical, but we're going to play these out. I, I do want to go back to this idea of one-to-one -one functions. So if you remember from section 3.1, any set of ordered pairs is a relation, all right? Some relations are functions, all right? And that's if you pass the vertical line test. And then some of those functions are one-to-one -one functions. And the way to determine that is if you pass the horizontal line test, okay? And the thing is, the reason that folks wanna find out, hey, do we have a one-to-one -one function is because if you are a one-to-one -one function, there's a very special property that f inverse exists. Let me write that as words. Or actually, I'll just write it as a symbol. So f inverse of x exists, okay? So I'm, I'm not guaranteed that functions have inverses, all right? Relations may or may not have inverses. The only time I'm guaranteed it is if I have a one-to-one -one function. So that's why we're gonna check through all sorts of things. Is my relation a function? If it is, great. Is my function one-to-one? -one? If it is, great. Then the inverse exists and we can find it with these three steps. All right, so let's see if we can figure this out. Now, when we had ordered pairs, all right, there's a couple of options you have here. You could graph this relation if you wanted to go pretty quickly through this. Oh, excuse me, you know, I didn't, I didn't actually read the directions. It says find the inverse of each function that is one-to-one. -one. So here's our first function with ordered pairs, right? This will be our next function, an actual equation to plug into. But when you have ordered pairs, all right, if, if you want, you can go through and graph this. And actually, let me scooch this up just to get a real quick graph on this. Let's see if it's a function, right? And I'm gonna do it, like I said, really teeny. So we'd have negative two, negative eight. I'd have negative one, one, zero, zero, and then one, three, something like that. All right, now, as I'm looking through this, I can see it's gonna pass the vertical line test, right? Because there's no repeats on the x-coordinates. All right, my x-coordinates are negative two, negative one, zero, one, no repeats. All right, would it pass the horizontal line test? Well, it would also pass the horizontal line test because there are no repeats on the y values. All right, so let's just write that out. Again, you could either graph it or you could just take note that no value was repeated. When no value is repeated, you're gonna pass the horizontal and vertical line tests. All right, so f is one-to-one, -one, or is a one-to-one -one function, because no values repeat. All right, now I wanna talk about domain and range of f, just to remind us what this looks like, all right? So we did this again back in section 3.1, but it never hurts to review. So the domain here would be the set of all x values. And when I just want discrete values, right? Just negative two, negative one, zero, one. I don't want all the values between them. We use these little squiggles here. All right, by that same notion, the range would be all of the y values. Okay, fantastic. Now I wanna talk about f inverse. So with f inverse, 
if I have ordered pairs, let's look at step one. It says just go ahead and interchange X and Y. That's all we want to do. All right, so let me go ahead, interchange X and Y. I'm going to scooch this up so we have some space to read all of this. All right, so here was F, right? This is, I should say, this is a domain. This was for function F. All right, and now let's go ahead and take a look at F inverse. All right. So F inverse is going to be some ordered pairs, but I'm going to flip-flop the order. So instead of negative 2, negative 8, we're going to say negative 8, negative 2. Now negative 1, 1 reflects on itself. And so does 0, 0 for that matter, which is fine. Now this ordered pair will turn into 3, 1. Great. And that's, that's it. That's all there is to F inverse. I know there's steps 2 and 3 up here, but they don't apply when you have ordered pairs. This is the end game. All right, you just say, oh, I flip flopped the X and Y, called it a day. All right, now I do wanna take a look at F inverses, domain and range, just so we can connect some dots and, and that'll play out in later examples in this section. So take a look at the domain of F inverse and take a look at the range of F inverse. I'm hoping we notice something. So let's take a look at the domain here. It looks like it's negative eight, negative one, zero and three. And the range is negative 2, negative 1, 0, and 1. So compare that to the domain and range of your original function. Are you taking note, or can you see that the domains and ranges flip-flopped? So all of the x values in the domain became all of the y values in the range. And all of the y values in the range became all of the x values in the domain. And that comes from the fact that the first thing we need to do is switch the x and y positions. So that's a big key relationship between functions and their inverses. Whatever the domain of f happens to be, it will wind up being the range of the inverse. And whatever the range of f, that will become the domain of your inverse. So just as the x's and y's flip-flop, so do the domains and ranges between a function and its inverse. Okay, so let's take a look at B. Now, let's think about this function. We know our toolkit function, okay? I know square root of x looks something like this. We've been talking about these toolkit functions for a while. Now let's talk about these transformations. So I see this negative out in front, okay? So negative. If I had that negative out in front of the grouping symbol, right, that would reflect my function down here, okay? So I'm gonna move it because I want to get a good idea of what that graph looks like. Okay, and then I have this plus two here. Now when you plus two outside of the function, you're going to shift this up two. So instead of starting at the origin, I would start at zero two. So let me move it up about two units. One, two, so it looks something like this. Okay, I don't quite know where it crosses the x-axis. I could figure that out. But, and let me, let me erase this and just make a little bit nicer function. All right, so we just said, it looks something like one, two, starts there, comes down, something like that. All right, so let's think about this. This is a function, it would pass the vertical line test. It would also pass the horizontal line test, right? So this function right here passes the horizontal line test so it's a one-to-one -one function. So let's, let's talk about this. So f of x is a one-to-one -one function because it passes oops, the horizontal line test. And let's just talk about its domain and range. It's always a good idea when dealing with functions to figure out their domains and ranges first. All right, I don't have a fraction, I do have a radical, I don't have a logarithm, but we do have a radical, so I need that radicand to be positive. Oh, and I should have mentioned we have a radical with an even index, right? So because this is an even number, I do have to worry about my domain issue. So in order for my radicand to be positive or zero, I need x to be greater than or equal to zero. So my domain is gonna be zero to infinity. And if I look at my range, well, I'm going down forever, and I go all the way up to a y value of 2. So my range is going to be negative infinity, positive 2. 
So those are just things to keep in mind. I haven't even gotten started on this problem, but that, that's what I've got here. Okay, so with that, let's try and find the inverse equation for this function. So I'm gonna scooch this down, okay, so that we can see the directions again. And we're gonna play this out. All right, so the first direction says interchange x and y. All right, so my y was two minus square root x. I'm going to interchange x and y. So my first step will be to say x is equal to two minus the square root of y. Okay, step one, interchanged x and y, done. Step two, solve for y. Okay, now I wanna get this y isolated. So if I wanna get that y isolated, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract two from both sides. So I will get x minus two is equal to the negative square root of y. I'm gonna write this in the other order, meaning I'm gonna write negative square root of y is equal to x minus two. All right, and let me start scooching this up. Um, so I'm, I'm working on this. I'm gonna solve for y, and then I'll try and leave step three in sight. Let's see if we can get that to work. All right. So I'm starting to solve for y. I'm gonna divide both sides by negative one. I'm gonna make sure I use alien here. So we've got the square root of y is equal to negative x plus two. Okay, and then because I've got this square root, what I'd like to do is square both sides. All right, and before I do this, I want you to think, am I allowed to distribute this exponent to the x and to the two? Are you allowed to distribute an exponent to a binomial? And the answer is no. You can't distribute exponents over addition or subtraction. You can do it over multiplication and division, but you can't do it over addition and subtraction. So going through this, all right, the square root of y squared is just y. I'm gonna need to FOIL this out or double distribute. All right, so now I'm looking at y would equal, all right, negative x times negative x is x squared. Outer is negative 2x, inner is negative 2x, we've got minus 4x, and then we've got plus 4, okay? All right, so with that, we found the equation for our inverse function, but we need to be careful because when you think about this, this inverse function, oh, just kidding, I, I forgot, we've got one more step, I almost forgot it, we've gotta do step three. All right, so step three is actually to write the symbol f inverse of x is equal to x squared minus four x plus four. All right, now I had mentioned this in part A, that when you take a look at the relationship between domains and range of the original function and its inverse, things flip-flop. So what I'm trying to say here is that this function, if we were just to graph x squared plus minus four x plus four, you would tell me it was the parabola and you would tell me the domain is all real numbers. And you would say all real numbers because there's no fractions, there's no radicals, there's no logs. And you'd be correct in that, but there's, there's a little bit more nuance when we're talking about the inverse function. Because domains and range flip-flops, right? If the range of my original function was negative infinity to two, then the domain here is implied to be negative infinity to two, which means we're only going to get half of the parabola graphed out. All right, and the reason why is because you only have half of a parabola here. This is the beginnings of a sideways parabola, right? If this had just come around, this would have been a sideways parabola. And we don't graph them as often, but you can do sideways parabolas. So the inverse function can't be an entire parabola. It's gotta be half of the parabola, all right? So one of the nuances that you have to be careful with when you're dealing with inverse functions you have to take a look at the domain and range of your original function because the range of your original function will be a restriction on the domain of the inverse function, okay? So let me scooch this down one more time and I wanna show you where this is highlighted and it's very subtle, right? It says any restrictions on X and Y should be considered. So those are domain and range restrictions. That's what, we're, what, that's what the definition is asking you to take a look at. So like I said, with these inverse functions, it's really nuanced in terms of the, um, the inverse functions and their domains and ranges. All right, so with that, let's take a look at the last example here. All right, so here, oops, let me scooch this up just a little bit more. I think we're missing some data. There we go. 
All right. So in part C, all right, we've got a new, another numerical example. So this is a bunch of ordered pairs. All right, so part B analytical, something to plug in, an equation to plug into and solve for. These are just A and C are numerical examples. So the table shows the number of days in Illinois that were unhealthy for sensitive groups for selected years using the AQI. Let H be the function defined in the table and the years forming the domain and range, excuse me, in the years forming the domain and the number of unhealthy days forming the range. All right, so what this is saying is in 2004, Illinois had seven days that were unhealthy in terms of air quality, right? And it looks like um, in 2005, they really had a rough time, right? They had 32 days uh, of um, unhealthy air. And it looks like 2007 was another bad, bad year. So 2004, 2006 were good. 2005, 2007 were bad. And 2008, 2009 were meh. All right. But the original directions in example two said find the inverse of each function that is one to one. So the first thing we need to answer is, is H one to one? Okay. That was the first thing we answered in part A. That was the first thing we answered in part B. If the answer to this is yes, then we want to talk about its domain and range. All right, so you have to decide how you want to tackle this being one to one or not. You could draw a graph or you could look for repeated values. So if I look on my axes, my domain, I see no repeats. That's a good sign, all right? When I look, because, actually before I move on, because there's no repeats here, I'm gonna have, uh, uh, um, oh my gosh, I can't use my words. It's definitely gonna be a function is what I'm trying to say. Um, let's take a look at the Y values, right? I see a problem here. We see a repeat, all right? Because there's a repeat, the answer to this question is no, all right? H is not one-to-one, -one, which then implies that H inverse does not exist. All right. So you need to be careful. If I ask you to find an inverse of a function, you have to verify whether or not it's one-to-one -one first. If it's one-to-one, -one, you can move on with the problem. If it's not one-to-one, -one, you stop and you tell me, hey, H inverse doesn't exist. Now, just for example, let's say 2009 wasn't a data point in my, in my table. If this second 13 wasn't here, all I would do was flip-flop the X and Y values. That would be my inverse function, just like we had in example A. All right, so with that, we're going to flip the page, graph some functions, try and get some domains and ranges, determine if things are one-to-one, -one, and find some inverse functions. I know it sounds like a lot, and it will be, but we'll, we'll tackle it, all right? I'll see you in a few. Bye.